Let's go over some basics of shoulder anatomy and imaging. The shoulder girdle is made of the three bones to attach our upper limb to our axial skeleton. These are the most notable features of these bones. On the clavicle, we have the sternal end and the acromial end. Just across from that is the acromion, also known as the acromial process of the scapula. The ligamentous connection between the scapula and the clavicle is the acromial clavicular joint or AC joint. The protruding structure over the joint itself is another scapular structure, the coracoid process. Let's look at the important structures that attach to it. There are two main ligaments, the acromioclavicular and the coracoclavicular, which has two regions if you want to be picky, the trapezoid and conoid. There are three muscles that attach here, the short head of the biceps, the brachii in blue, coracobrachialis in purple, and the pectoralis minor in green. An AC joint separation is the most common way to damage the coracoid process. On the radiograph, we can see the separation between the clavicle and the acromion of the scapula. However, look more closely above the coracoid process and you can see a tiny bone fragment. This is an avulsion fracture where the coracoclavicular ligament tore and took some bone with it. While we're looking at these structures, we definitely should address the grading of the injury to the acromioclavicular joint, which is the Rockwood classification system. The first three are a sequential series of strain, rupture, strain to a complete dislocation. Rockwood 1 is a strain or partial rupture on the AC ligament with the inferior border of the clavicle will be in line with the acromion seen by the dotted line. Rockwood 2 progresses to a rupture of the AC ligament, but now the coracoclavicular ligament is strained. However, the inferior border of the clavicle does not extend above the superior border of the chromion. We can see that with the dotted line. Finally, in a Rockwood 3 is a complete rupture of the coracoclavicular ligament and the displacement of the clavicle from the acromion where the inferior border extends above the superior border of the acromion. But the distance between the clavicle and the coracoid is not more than 25 millimeters. Four, five, and six are all variations of a Rockwood 3. There's a complete disruption of the coracoclavicular ligament as well as complete rupture of the acromioclavicular ligament. Rockwood 4, the clavicle has completely broken away from the acromion and is now extended posteriorly. In 5, this is the same as in a 3, but now this time the distance here from the inferior border up is much more, and it's more than 25 millimeters. Rockwood 6 is anterior and inferior displacement of the clavicle. So what classification do you think is occurring in this image? This is going to be a 3. Okay, back to the anatomy features. The actual shoulder joint is the articulation of the head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula. The articular surface of the humeral head relative to the shallow surface of the glenoid is what offers the very large range of motion as well as the instability of the joint. The soft tissue labrum deepens the cup or socket, which is not seen on the radiograph. On the proximal humerus, the two bumps are the greater and lesser tubercles. The term tubercle is a term specific to the humerus, but it can also be called a tuberosity. Between these structures is the intertubecular groove where the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii fit in, also known as the bicipital groove. The long head of the biceps brachii travels up to attach the superior border of the glenoid cavity directly onto the labrum. This image also shows a slap lesion. Slap stands for superior, labral, anterior, posterior tear, or lesion. This MRI shows a normal shoulder on the left and a slap tear on the right. Both MRI images have contrast, but the one with the damage shows a greater amount of fluid in the joint capsule, highlighting the gap or tear in the superior labrum. The first diagram showed the slap tear on the superior surface, which is not entirely correct. This diagram is a better representation of the slap region on the underside of the tendon insertion. Using this image to move to another common shoulder problem, the Bankart lesion in the anterior inferior rim of the glenoid. In this shoulder representation, we see the humerus, scapula, and the white labrum. Now the humerus has moved out of the socket and in the position of an anterior shoulder dislocation. 
There's an, here's another view looking down at the top of the shoulder. Now the humerus is moved to the position of the anterior dislocation. This location can cause a tear in the labrum, which is called a Bankart lesion. From this lateral view, you can see the labral tear away from the glenoid cavity. If a piece of bone comes off the glenoid surface with the labral tear, now it's called a bony bank art. Can you see the bony bank art? It is a little piece of bone detached from the glenoid rim. On a radiograph, you would not see the labral tear. That would require further MRI imaging to evaluate. Back to the superior view of an anterior dislocation. Notice the impact area on the head of the humerus against the rim of the glenoid. This causes an impact fracture on the humeral head. This image more clearly shows the depression caused by the impact on the posterior superior lateral humeral head known as a Hillsax lesion. Here's a great example of a bony bank art from the glenoid and the resulting Hillsax lesion on the humeral head. Here are two views of an anterior shoulder dislocation. The classic representing sign is the patient coming in holding their arm awkwardly in front of them. On the image, we can see the shoulder is clearly pushed inward and not within the capsule itself or the glenoid cavity. And on the lateral or Y view, we can see how the head of the humerus is pushed now closer towards the torso. The posterior shoulder dislocation is less common and a little harder to detect. The main feature you hear from radiologists is that the humeral head and neck look like a light bulb with a uniformly round head. On the right are two different normal images, so you can see normal variations, but more importantly, see the tubercles laterally and more prominently round head region facing the glenoid cavity. On the right, we see from the lateral scapula view, also known as the Y view. Normally, the head of the humerus is in the center of the arms of the Y. A posterior dislocation will show it shifted away from the ribs. Moving back to fractures, another common fracture in the shoulder region is shown here. Can you see it? What structure is damaged? The greater tubercle or tuberosity fracture. What muscles are attached? Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Here we see two of the ones I just mentioned, supraspinatus and teres minor. Infraspinatus is not seen in this view, but we can see subscapularis, which is attached to the lesser tubercle. On the right is another radiograph of a greater tubercle fracture with the corresponding MRI on the left showing the extent of the inflammation and the area of damage. Let's review the structures on a radiograph again. The eucromium and clavicle have a nice gap. The coracoid is a nice oval structure with a rim and it faces anteriorly. The head of the humerus overlaps the glenoid cavity. Now let's go through the main ligaments holding these bones together the coracoclavicular ligaments attaching the coracoid to the clavicle, the AC or acromioclavicular joint, the coracoacromial ligament makes the roof of the coracoacromial arch, the glenohumeral ligaments are superior, middle, and inferior. The inferior glenohumeral ligament is drawn in a loop to allow for space when we raise our arm upward. Finally, let's walk through the attachment of the rotator cuff muscles and the biceps brachii. Finding the greater and lesser tubercles, these are the attachment sites for the rotator cuff muscles. Now the short head of the biceps brachii goes straight to the coracoid process, and the long head goes up through the inner tubecular or bicipital groove to attach to the superior rim of the glenoid, fusing with the labrum. This is the only tendon in the body that is intracapsular in that it runs through the capsule of the glenohumeral joint. Starting superiorly, supraspinatus starts from above the spine over the coracoid underneath the chromion to attach the superior border of the greater tuberosity. Infraspinatus posteriorly under the spine comes around the humeral head to the middle portion of the greater tuberosity. Teres minor also coming around posteriorly to the humeral head, attaching slightly inferior to the infraspinatus attachment to the inferior border of the greater tuberosity. 
Finally, subscapularis located anterior to the scapula between the scapula and the ribs is going anterior to the humerus to attach to the lesser tuberosity or tubercle. Now we can try to find these structures on a sagittal MRI. First, figure out anterior and posterior. Here is the acromion, which makes this the posterior side. These black areas around the head of the humerus are tendons, specifically rotator cuff tendons. Superiorly, we see supraspinatus and anteriorly subscapularis. Here's a more nicely labeled image of all four of the rotator cuff muscles, subscapularis on the anterior side, supraspinatus on the superior portion, infraspinatus just below the edge there of the acromion as it draws into the spine of the scapula, and then a little sl thin sliver of a line for teres minor. A deeper view where we can see the muscle bellies first identify the bones. Here we see the acromion, with its close relationship to the clavicle, then on the anterior side is the coracoid process. Within the muscles, see the black dots? These are still tendon structures. This is the supraspinatus tendon. Let's name the muscles. We have supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. They kind of fuse together. They're two distinct muscles, but sometimes they look like one blob together. And then on the anterior side, subscapularis. These are the sits muscles. And here are your learning objectives for the shoulder.